I'm here with Dr. Will Bolsowitz. So Will, what are the reasons that people bloat? Well, actually, it's interesting, Thomas. This is one of the most, reason, most common reasons that people go to a gastroenterologist. And there are some surprises for why you would develop bloating. It's not so simple as just, hey, it's this one thing or this two thing. So I wanna go through five different potential reasons and hopefully help some of the people who are watching your channel. Perfect, let's dive in. What's the first one? After this video, I popped the link down below for 30% off through Thrive Market. If you do grocery shopping, which everyone does, I recommend you give them a shot because that's a 30% off discount link through your entire grocery order. So Thrive Market, you can just sort by diet type, you can sort by sugar-free, you can sort by keto, paleo, and then it just gets delivered to your doorstep. But it's worth a shot with that 30% off discount link. Plus you get a $50 free gift when you use my link down below. They've been a sponsor on this channel for a very long time, so a huge thank you to them for extending the discount to my viewers as well as helping support this channel. So that link is down below. All right, uh, so we have to start with the obvious, which is a damaged gut, right? If you have a damaged gut, living inside of you, first of all, is this community we call the microbiome. This community of invisible, invisible microorganisms includes bacteria, yeasts, these things called archaea, and even uh, some parasites. And by the way, there are parasites that are actually incredibly healthy and we wish that we could have, like there's one called blastocystis. But anyway, living there, like this is an ecosystem. And when an ecosystem is in balance, it's doing its job, it's strong, it's making you the best human possible, and it's also resilient. It can hold up, you know, you go out for Mexican food and it's like, your gut will be fine, it can handle this, right? Um, but when a person suffers with a damaged gut, whether it be because of antibiotics, dietary pattern, lack of exercise, poor sleep patterns, there's a number of different things, many of which are extremely common in American society. When a person suffers with a damaged gut, they're prone to bloating. And this could manifest with a condition like irritable bowel syndrome, IBS. It could also manifest with small intestine bacterial overgrowth, which we call SIBO. Gas and bloating is extremely common in these conditions, irritable bowel syndrome or SIBO. So, you know, the question is like, how do you know whether or not you have a damaged gut, right? How do you know if there's something going on there that may be causing your gas and bloating? There's a couple things that I look for as a gastroenterologist. Um, one of them, I look at your bowel movements. Like, not me personally, I'm not gonna come over to your house and take a look, but you should look. Like, seriously, you should look at your bowel movements because um, what they're supposed to be is like a sausage, soft but formed, have a torpedo style shape. And when you go to poop, it should be like this effortless thing where it just feels very natural and you get satisfied afterwards. Like literally it should be satisfying. Um, when it deviates from this, it can move towards hard, mumpy, bumpy, or turn into like literally balls of stool. You're moving towards constipation. Or it could be moving more towards loose and watery, diarrhea style. Either way, um, this is one of the ways that I like determine whether or not a person has a healthy gut. Um, I also want to know like, do you have symptoms? If you consume food and you suffer from gas and bloating or other digestive symptoms, it's highly probable that you have a damaged gut. And so this is one of the other major things that I would look at. And the third thing that I would look at is there are all of these conditions that are not just digestive related, Thomas. There are conditions that are related to our metabolism, our immune system, our hormones, our mood, our brain health. Common conditions, obesity, insulin resistance, type two diabetes. Um, these conditions are associated with a damaged gut. So, and what I typically will see in a patient who has a damaged gut, they may come to me for digestive symptoms, but when you look at their medical history, what you see is there's all these different things that are simultaneously there. It could be that they have, you know, that they're overweight and they also have endometriosis or polycystic ovary syndrome and also anxiety. And you just kind of see there's this pattern that exists. So the three ways that I can assess for whether or not there's a damaged gut in a person who has um, uh, gas and bloating are looking at the bowel movements, whether or not they have digestive symptoms, and also what, are, what, what other medical uh, issues do they have that could be associated with the damaged gut. Yeah, that good, that really puts a nice little package on this because people don't always understand, okay, you've got a disrupted gut or you know, gut dysbiosis. You, know, you really package that up well with like, what that actually looks like because people think, oh, 
well, I'm in balance, or I'm not bloating, but I don't have these other issues, or I do have these other issues, but I'm not bloating. And we talk about gut dysbiosis all the time, but it's really difficult to put sort of a label on it outside of that. It is very difficult to put a label on it. And the interesting thing about it is that there's all these commercial-based um, tests to like, you know, assess your stool and tell you what's going on with your gut. And the vast majority of them have never been clinically validated in research. And you may pay $600 to have a stool test done. And it actually, I, I would argue that the information is not reliable. Like to me, what's really truly reliable is what's going on with your poop? What, what digestive symptoms do you have? What is the pattern of your medical history? Like that to me is far more reliable than a test that has not been clinically validated. Now I should add real quick, like I'm, I'm the US medical director of a company called Zoe. And part of what we do is stool testing, but we also do CGM testing. We also do lipid testing. So it's far more complicated than just the poop with our company. And we also have published in literally the top journal multiple times uh, called Nature Medicine. We've published multiple papers there. Yeah. So that's interesting. That's an, almost another topic we could do for another day is that relationship between uh, glucose and, and the gut as well, because there's a very strong one there, which people yeah, don't definitely. always realize like, oh, my blood sugar's you know, completely out of whack or how we respond to a given food is a lot of times just highly varied based upon their gut. So, okay, with that, so what's the, what's the second reason that people might be insanely bloated? All right, um, I'm gonna go with what I would describe as the most common cause of gas and bloating, and it's going to surprise and shock a lot of people because it's not actually, from my perspective, it's not food that is the most common cause of gas and bloating. It's your bowel motility, specifically constipation. In my experience as a gastroenterologist, literally, I would argue, almost 100% of people who have constipation have gas and bloating. And there are a bazillion people out there who are like literally listening to us right now who they don't think that they're constipated, but they actually are. And that's the reason why they're having gas and bloating. And if they could just fix their bowel motility and get their gut into a rhythm, the gas and bloating would go away. I saw you post something a while back that I thought was very interesting. And that was, I think you quote said, you can have one bowel movement per day and still be constipated. Definitely. Yeah. And you could also have diarrhea and still be constipated. And I think it's worth us unpacking that because, um, no pun intended. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> because, um, because the thing is that like what it, delivering value to, to these people is helping them to understand their own body and the way that they feel. So they're trying to understand why they have gas and bloating. And the thing about it is you could poop every day, but the question is, are you completely evacuating? And there are many people that they strain, they struggle, they're pushing on the toilet. It's like literally effort-based to have a bowel movement. Or they go and they don't feel like they actually emptied. Or sometimes they go once and then it's like 30 minutes later, they're like, oh gosh, I gotta, like, I gotta poop again. Like I didn't finish the first time. These to me are all signs that like you're not actually emptying the way that you're supposed to. And you know, when we go to have a bowel movement, if you are a once a day pooper, then that once a day, like it has to be a complete evacuation and get everything out. If hypothetically you move 70% of it out, but you trap 30%, and this is the pattern that you have day by day, then it doesn't take very long for you to start backing up to a place where this is really messing with your body. And when a person is constipated, the most common symptom is going to be gas and bloating. So as you start to back up, you're going to experience this gas and bloating, and you may not have any other symptoms of constipation, and you may not even think that you're constipated. But the point is, if you're not completely evacuating, then we need to get the bowels moving and get that coming out. And when you actually, when you actually mobilize that stool, um, these people, they feel better. Like this is, this is the way that I actually measure response to therapy in a person who's constipated is what's going on with your gas and bloating. Like that's what I would literally ask them in the clinic. Wow. Okay. So we'll probably do some other content surrounding, you know, how to improve that specifically, because I'm sure that's a very wide range, but I mean, can you just give a couple quick, quick things without having to go into super exquisite detail 
maybe some low-hanging fruit for people that are constipated or don't know they're constipated but are. Yeah, totally. So I have an online course that like for people who want to take a deep dive into this topic because you know, obviously I'm, we're just touching the surface here. So um, if you want to do a two and a half hour deep dive into constipation to understand all of the nuance to this, then um, uh, check out my online course that I have. But where do I start? So in the, in the majority of patients where I will start with them is a combination of a fiber supplement and simultaneously magnesium, oral magnesium. Now you of course have to check this with your doctor. Don't just like watch a YouTube video and then start doing this. Like make sure that this is okay for you specifically. But um, the thing about the magnesium is that it actually works to draw water into the intestines. And so that helps to sort of lubricate the bowels and float, <laughs> sort of floating the log down the river, right? So that's what the magnesium helps us to accomplish. There's a couple of specific types of magnesium that you want to use because by the way, not all magnesium is created the same. So there's certain types like we hear about how magnesium is great for sleep or magnesium is good for your mood. And that's, you know, referring to the types that are like magnesium glycinate, which is rapidly absorbed. So it doesn't really stay into your inside your intestines long enough to sort of pull the water in. So the types that I recommend in terms of magnesium are magnesium sulfate, magnesium oxide, or magnesium citrate. And depending on how you're approaching this, and by the way, again, like we could talk for like literally at least 10 more minutes just on magnesium alone. Depending on how you're approaching this, if you're doing this as a daily dose, just to sort of gently nudge things along, then what you would do is typically start with 500 milligrams of magnesium. That's your starting dose. Um, classically, I ask people to take it before bedtime because it may help you sleep as well and helps you get that good bowel movement when you wake up in the morning. If you do 500 milligrams for a couple of days, four days or a week, uh, you don't notice a difference, then you bump it up and you go up to 750 or you go up to 1000. Now, one of the uh, important things about magnesium is that we have the ability to test your magnesium levels. So we don't need to guess, we don't need to assume. We can actually check before and we can check once you get on a stable dose and know that you're where you're, need, where you're supposed to be. The vast majority of people in my experience, I'm sure you've seen this too, the vast majority of people, you check their magnesium when they're not on a magnesium supplement. And in the United States, no matter what diet you're consuming, even a plant-based diet, these people tend to be low on magnesium. Most people are low on magnesium in the United States. So what we're doing in a way is just adding back what their body actually needs. And then when they get on a stable dose that could be 750 or 1000 milligrams of magnesium, actually when you double check it, what you find is that their magnesium is right where it's supposed to be. And by the way, the same is true for fiber. Um, the beauty of fiber, fiber helps to accelerate our bowel motility. It also creates changes within the microbiome. And these microbes, it's more than just having healthy microbes. The healthy microbes are helping to stimulate bowel motility. So it's sort of this compounded effect of yes, fiber is moving your, moving your motility along, but it's also supporting the microbes that we need to move our motility along. And this is why we wanna add more fiber in addition to the magnesium. So what do you say to the people that are watching this that are say, oh, this guy's you know, full of it. If I have fiber, I bloat. You know, like fiber, fiber absolutely destroys me. Every time I have fiber, it just bloats me more. Because I know there's gonna be people that say that. I know some of the answer to this, but I wanna hear it from, from the man himself. Yeah, well, you're saying that I'm full of it, but I'm saying that you're full of it. So, <laughs> like, because the chances are you actually, there's a very real possibility that you're constipated. And um, if you take that person who has constipation and they have these types of intolerances with fiber, then um, if you get their bowels moving and you clear out their colon, they're not gonna have that issue anymore. So if, if a person is constipated, step one is to fix the constipation. That being said, with fiber, we already talked about um, having damaged gut or dysbiosis. These are the people that struggle to consume or add fiber to their diet. They're also the people who need fiber the most because fiber is what they need actually to heal their gut and to make their gut stronger. So avoiding fiber is not a winning strategy in the long term, even if it makes you feel a little bit better for today. So we need to start really low on the fiber and gently ease our way into it. And by doing this, it's conceptually similar to exercise. No matter where, like when you step into the gym, a good trainer will meet you where you are, understand what your capabilities are, and match the exercise to your capabilities. We need to match the diet to your capabilities in terms of digesting fiber. Your gut is like a muscle. It can be trained, it can be made stronger. That's very good input. 
All right, so moving on down the line, what would you say number three is? Oh, well, so since we're talking about fiber, we might as well, we've already sort of touched on this. I would say fiber and FODMAPs. Okay, so now fiber is a part of every single plant's food. Every single plant, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, seeds, nuts, and legumes contains fiber. This is where you find it. And um, the thing about fiber is that we as humans, we don't naturally have the enzymes to break down and digest fiber. And that's because we, we sort of outsourced it to our microbiome. Our microbiome is so wildly adaptable that they contain the enzymes. So while we don't, we don't have those enzymes to do this, they have like literally tens of thousands of enzymes that they use to break down and process our fiber. You need a healthy, a healthy microbiome to break down fiber. But if like you approach this the way that we're describing, starting low and gently introducing it, then you can start with an amount that your microbiome can handle, and then they, they build up these enzymes. And like we literally see this in clinical trials. When people add fiber to their diet, you see that these enzymes start to be represented in a, in a greater fashion. And that's how you sort of overcome the gas and bloating that comes from fiber. So if you are consuming a lot of fiber and you're having a lot of gas and bloating, number one, make sure you're not constipated. Number two, try reducing your fiber intake. Like not hard, not eliminating, just reducing. And then gently adding back over time. The same is true, by the way, for FODMAPs. Now, not all plants contain a significant amount of FODMAPs. Um, FODMAP is an acronym. It's uh, super nerdy, I'm just gonna say it, but it stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. Now, these are all carbohydrate-based foods, and they are uh, fermented in our body. And by being fermented by our microbes, they produce gas. Now, it makes it sound like, you know, why would you eat these foods? They're not good for you. But actually, the vast majority of FODMAPs are prebiotic, which means that they help to feed and nourish our microbes and make them stronger. So, like, we don't want to eliminate FODMAPs. We just want to understand FODMAPs so that, once again, we can adapt our diet to those FODMAPs. Um, if a person comes in to see me and is having gas and bloating, there's a specific dietary recommendation that I would make right off the bat that has to do with FODMAPs. I would tell them, take a break from dairy and eliminate artificial sweeteners. Because from my perspective, I don't believe that people actually need dairy. Whether or not you can be healthy with dairy is a different question. But I don't think that you need dairy and you definitely don't need artificial sweeteners. And so if you eliminate these things, what I've found actually, Thomas, is that a huge percentage of people who have gas and bloating, their symptoms improve by doing this. So like, if you're listening to this, try that. That's wild, which uh, I mean, at the time of recording this, I'm not sure, we don't have to go into detail on it, but did you see that University of North Carolina study that came out on Splenda? Sucralose last week? It just came out, right? Just like came last out. Week? Like, yeah, I'm filming a video on it after this because it's, it's pretty wild. I mean, it's, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. I don't talk on artificial sweeteners a lot because the data is just inconclusive and I can't draw any solid points, but I'll put it this way. This scared me enough to be like, I don't know if I even want this stuff in my life. The, uh, the World Health Organization, you probably saw this as well. The World Health Organization recently uh, released a report um, raising concerns that artificial sweeteners are actually bad for our metabolism, that it increases the likelihood of insulin resistance and that actually people have long-term weight gain because the issue is that the randomized control trials that are done are all short term. So like you do it for three months or six months, you may lose weight during that temporary period of time by substituting artificial sweeteners for sugar. But then what ends up happening is we think that it actually um, changes the microbiome. And so then the microbiome actually is harvesting energy more aggressively as a result of the changes that are taking place. So this is, there's concerns even about whether or not they're okay for us from a metabolic perspective. So those are some really good pragmatic tips there. Yeah. Uh, what else have we got? Okay, um, so I got two more. And um, since we're on the topic of food, I feel inclined to go to this place and talk about histamine. Mm. All right, so histamine is something that's like naturally occurs within our body. Um, we need histamine to be healthy humans. It's involved in all kinds of different things, including like digestion and stuff like that. But the issue is that we can have an excess of histamine there's a number of ways that this could happen, and it can re result in symptoms. And in excess of histamine, like people think about like seasonal allergies, and like histamine in that case is getting released by immune cells. But you could also have histamine in your diet. And um, what happens when it's in your diet is that it's actually being produced by microbes. 
So it's sort of a part of the food life cycle. So like if you were to take spinach, for example, spinach is classically referred to as a high histamine food. And that's because the, the spinach gets harvested at the farm. It gets popped into a package. That package sits on a truck, gets shipped across the country, pops, shows up in your supermarket. And, that was, and it was harvested 10 days ago, right? And th so this is during that, those 10 days, there's microbes that are part of the plant microbiome because like everything that's alive on this planet has a microbiome, including the plants that we eat. So the plant microbiome is basically like creating histamine. And so for a person who is histamine intolerant, they consume that spinach and it causes trouble. So, and the number one symptom of histamine intolerance is actually gas and bloating. Now, typically it won't be gas and bloating in isolation. And I wanna also be completely clear that this is not the number one thing that I would think about as a gastroenterologist. Again, my algorithm is like, you come in to see me, okay, stop dairy and, and artificial sweeteners. Let's make sure that you're not constipated. Let's heal your gut. Let's be careful about fiber and FODMAPs. But I would come to this, particularly if you're having sort of symptoms throughout your body. You're having gut symptoms, but you're also having a runny nose after you eat or you're seeing uh, hives or a rash or some sort of skin changes, or you're having headaches. Actually, like histamine is extremely tied to both headaches and migraines. What about wheezing? You get some wheezing with that? Absolutely. Yeah, so it's a multi-system thing, right? Which um, you have to sort of open your mind to, what if this gut symptom is more than just my gut? What if it's like a whole body uh, type of phenomenon? So, but nonetheless, the histamine that it's in our food, the most high histamine uh, foods that exist, and I just wanna, I wanna put this out there, and the people who are listening, think in your mind, is, could, this, could this be something with you? So, the highest histamine foods are fermented foods. So, and that includes like alcohol, uh, that includes vinegar, and chocolate, like those are fermented foods. Um, so, but like also yogurt and kefir and sauerkraut and kimchi and kombucha. Uh, fish tends to be very high in histamine. Again, it has to do with the harvesting. So the fish gets caught, but then it's like you kept on ice for 10 or 14 days before it actually shows up in your supermarket. So fish can be high histamine foods. And then among the plant-based world, um, the good news is that most plants end up not being super high in histamine, but there are some specific ones that can be problematic. And so that includes spinach, avocados, eggplant, and tomatoes. Those are sort of the classics. Um, lemons or other citrus foods can be problematic. So, and you know, by the way, uh, we're talking about fiber, FODMAPs, and histamine. And for people that have these specific issues, uh, I actually wrote an entire book about this. It was my cookbook. So many people don't realize, like the cookbook, it has recipes, but it's not just recipes, it's actually embedded in the recipes are dietary protocols that you can use to address and fix FODMAP issues or histamine issues. Have you heard I've, uh, excuse me, have you heard of using uh, quercetin for, for histamine? Yeah, there's a number of different supplements that actually can be beneficial. And the other thing that can be beneficial for a person who has histamine issues is actually healing the gut. Yeah. So, cause, cause part of what's happening here is that um, people that have histamine intolerance it's because they have a damaged gut An and LPS that gut guy. barrier. Yep. Yeah, so like we could call it increased intestinal permeability or we could call it leaky gut. We're talking about the same thing. But basically what's happening is the histamine that's in your food is now easily getting into your bloodstream and causing trouble. Yeah, that's uh, something we talk about a lot on this channel is that especially, and the, the additional secondary inflammatory response that happens just as a result of the LPS kind of leaking through. Um, yeah, I mean, personal anecdotal experience. I was uh, dealing with histamine issues myself and uh, Yes, I don't know if you know Dr. Kyle Gillette. I had him on this channel, but yeah. he's also, uh, he's, he's my uh, concierge doc, he's my doc. And he, he's the one that helped turn me on to the quercetin piece. So, you know, having 500 to 1,000 milligrams quercetin has been an absolute game changer uh, surrounding certain foods. I used to get, I would get red, I would get wheezy. At night, I'd be like really wheezing. Yeah. Um, it's uh, pretty wild. And it's, you know, something that came on and, and now kind of reverse engineering and kind of taking care of my gut. Part of the issue for me was I spent years doing a very, very, very low carb diet and have recently come into more carb cycling. And I think adding these different foods in has been a little bit hard on the gut. So that's why it's had these changes that yeah. kind of brought this histamine issue to life that I never had before. 
now we're kind of understanding getting under control. So that one resonates a lot with me. Dude, that's amazing. And um, that, that, you know, it's nice for people to hear that like a person like you has um, dealt with something like this. And because part of the issue is that many times this gets dismissed by a conventional Western doctor. And look, I love Western medicine. My life has been dedicated to Western medicine. But the problem is that the system is really messed up because if you go to your gastroenterologist and say, I have bloating and a headache and a runny nose, the gastroenterologist like me is gonna say to you, I'll deal with the bloating, but you gotta go see a neurologist for your headache and you gotta go see an ENT for your runny nose or an allergist. And so like that sort of fractionation of care, you know, we need a holistic approach for this. This is the issue. So part of our responsibility, like this conversation, is just to make people aware of these connections mm -hmm. between symptoms from different systems that um, if you start to think about it, then you can ask the right questions and potentially get to this diagnosis. Yeah. Okay, so we've got four. So what's this uh, fifth and final one? Okay, the fifth and final one. So I've, we've been really focusing on what I consider sort of gas and bloating of like the, the stomach, but I wanna talk about belching because um, the, the main cause of belching can also be a cause of gas and bloating as well. So this is for the people who are having belching and also gas and bloating. And the issue here is swallowed air. Hmm. So most people don't realize, like if you do, uh, when I was a kid, it was like fun with my friends to like try to do the ABCs by belching, right? And you like go yeah. through the alphabet. There. Yep. Yeah. And when you're doing that, that's not air that's produced inside your body. That's not a fart that comes from your colon all the way backwards through your intestines. That's not, that's not the way it works. And that's also why it doesn't smell like a fart. Um, what that is, is you're actually swallowing air. Every single time you do that, you're swallowing air and then you're sending it back up through your vocal cords as a belch. Hmm. There are some people that have a condition called aerophasia, and these are the people who are belching repeatedly, repeatedly throughout an hour or two hours or throughout the day. They just keep belching. And what they don't realize is that they are actually swallowing air right before they belch it right back up. So they have to be conscious of this, that there's actually this connection that like, um, it's one of the hardest conversations to have with a patient because they think that you're accusing them of like, I don't know, being weird or stupid, <laughs> right? Because you're basically saying to them like, y you actually are doing this. You actually are swallowing air and belching it up. It's a behavioral thing, but they don't, they don't realize that that's what's happening. Now, of course, along with this, in addition to aerophasia, which is by the way, the person who's like belching repeatedly, the other thing, like if you have gas and bloating, then it's way too obvious to me to like be careful not to add more air into the system. So if you're drinking carbonated drinks all day long, like carbonated drinks, that is gas that you are introducing into the intestines, right? It's going to come out one way or the other. You can either belch it up or you can pass it as gas from below. If you chew gum or you suck on candies, um, typically what happens is because you're creating a lot of saliva, you'll start swallowing more. And every time you swallow, you don't think you're swallowing air, you are swallowing air, at least some. And, um, and then the other thing is like, if you think about a straw, most of us haven't like really analyzed the, a straw and like what's happening. But if you take a look at it, you put the straw into a cup and like the bottom half, whatever the water level is, is water, but everything above the water is air. And so you wrap your lips around it, you create a vacuum and you swallow that air down. And so sipping through straws, um, chewing on gum or hard candies um, or carbonated drinks, these are all uh, potential reasons that people might be gassy. One, one other thing I should mention too is like, um, I, I have some people, like I enjoy watching people who are aggressive eaters. It's fun for me. Like they like, you know, they go at their food. Like I like, I like the people that do like the triple bite, like that just one bite, but like that, arr, 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 like that. <laughs> Aggressive eaters or aggressive drinkers, people that are chugging stuff, people that are like really going hard at their food and very fast, they swallow air. It's, it's sloppy swallowing when you're doing that. So, and then just be aware, like you have gas and bloating or, or you feel unwell after a meal. This is part of the reason why you're going too aggressive. You have to slow down. Yeah, I've noticed that with myself. It was, uh, and, and it explains why, you know, start the day not really bloated, but then as I start eating, it's, then it starts, you know. Are you a triple biter? I'm not sure, probably a double biter. But, you know, I, mean, I just, I, uh, I just eat fast, you know, and it's, it's something that I know even Dude, metabolically that I, I should We should but comment on this. Beyond just gas and bloating, um, eating, rate, eating rate has actually been strongly tied to metabolism. Yep. And so um, slowing down our eating rate is one of the important things that we can do in terms of improving our metabolism. I mean, it also coincides directly with, I mean, you see a lot of people that are just uh, 
shallow breathers and just anxious in general, a lot of times just swallow air through their natural breath. If they're holding, they're holding their breath, not realizing they're holding their breath, and they, you know, you're like involuntarily also swallowing air too. So there's, there's that, you know, there's like really strong correlations between belching and uh, anxiety episodes as well. That people don't always realize, well, I'm not always belching, but a lot of times I get super gassy. Well, were you, did you have a fight with your girlfriend the night before? And were you super stressed out? And were you anxious? And uh, that also has an effect, I'm sure, on the microbiome that we could talk about as well. Dude, but. that is a great point because one of the ways that I actually treat this issue for the people that have this aerophasia where they're swallowing air and belching repeatedly. One of the ways that I've had great success in treating these patients is with a medication called Buspirone or Buspar. Mm -hmm. And um, Buspar uh, works pretty quick, but it actually, it, it affects um, in some ways the way that your gut works. It's not just, it's not just your mood, but obviously it was designed and um, FDA approved to treat mood disorders. So, and there's a number of different examples where drugs that were approved for mood disorders, you know, major depression or something like that, actually have tremendous value with digestive problems. And the cool thing about Buspirone, I do know this, is that it's not a, you know, selective like SSRI, so you're not di disrupting a potential feedback loop. So it's one of those that acts fast yep. and you're typically not developing a, uh, a dependency or not even dependency, but you know, if you go on SSRI, obviously not my wheelhouse hundred percent, but you know, you go on that, you can have a, you can have a swing if you come off of it. Oh yeah, uh, you give a swing in the beginning and you can have a swing in the end if you come off too fast. That's yeah, interesting. So just be very gentle and careful about it. Uh, Buspirone is, is I, I know, you know, off record, it's prescribed a lot for uh, uh, PMS. A lot of times when uh, people start getting into like their phase during the week before their period or things like that, where they start getting a lot of anxiety or things like that, it's usually a short-term interventional, interventional. If you feel like, hey, you're getting, uh, women are getting really like, irritable and really, and they feel it, right? Uh, you know, sometimes they're, they'll prescribe, seeing that prescribed in that case, which is kind of interesting, but. Well, and what's interesting about that is also when women's hormones um, fluctuate, there's actually very strong ties be between estrogen and histamine, like massively strong mm. ties. They're like Bonnie and Clyde, they're like riding together. And um, so um, we do believe that many of the symptoms that women experience as they cycle through their menstrual cycle uh, may in fact be triggered not just by the hormones, but in fact by the histamine that's paired with the hormones. Wow. All right, man. So where can everyone find you though? Uh, you can find me on Instagram as the Gut Health MD, Facebook, the Gut Health MD, TikTok. I am the Gut Health MD underscore because I think there's like a 15 year old kid who took my handle. <laughs> uh, you can find me um, more about me and my, uh, my books, my courses at theplantfedgut.com. And, uh, so yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, you bet, man. I'll link to all that stuff down below. Thank so, you, brother. Thanks for coming on. Yeah.